this morning, I have chosen as a topic, uh, it's titled on the screen there, Quantity versus Quality, the Case for Good Food. And I'm going to talk to you about food. And I'm going to bring out a few object lessons from the discussion that I think are relevant to our uh, spiritual life. And as we read for the scripture, I'm going to start with 3 John chapter 1. There's only one chapter. Verse 2. It's on the screen there for you to read, but we've read it or you've heard it already. Uh, 3 John verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Paul, excuse me, John here, rather, is writing to a well-beloved friend in verse 1, whose name was Gaius. Gaius was a common name in uh, the first century. And uh, we don't know much about who Gaius was, so we know very little, in fact, about him, other than what's here in this uh, epistle. And there's some speculation that this may have been the Gaius that Paul knew, or there were several others in the New Testament. But point being, John's writing to a friend. And to his friend, we read in verse 2, that he wishes three things for Gaius. He wishes prosperity. He wishes health. And, of course, spiritual prosperity. I'm going to put those on the screen there one at a time. The first thing that uh, John wished for Gaius was prosperity. And literally, the Greek word there means to have a good journey. Now, Gaius wasn't going anywhere, and John was not telling him to have a good trip. Unless you're talking about the trip of life. And that is what John was talking about. In general, the word means to be successful, to uh, prosper financially, temporally. You'll notice here 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, that Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, and he was talking to them about offerings that they should take up uh, for, for, of course, the service of the Lord's house. Upon the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, by the way, uh, let every one of you lay by him in store, that is, take your funds on Sunday morning, some, sometimes Sunday at least, and put those in a spot in your house where they'll be safe for the rest of the week. Uh, historical commentary on that verse is that people in those days may have been paid early in the week rather than us traditionally who are paid based on a two-week schedule or a bi-monthly schedule or at the end of the work week. So he goes on, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So your, your offering here in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, was to be in proportion to the way God had blessed you financially in your temporal affairs. <clears throat> and I just want to encourage you that God cares about your finances, not because of what you can give to the church, <clears throat> but he cares about your finances because he cares about you. If you read this verse again, 3 John verse 2 that is, you see a balance between three things. And one of those things is temporal prosperity. Let's look at the second one here. John wishes that his friend would be in good health. Now the Greek word for health, there's two of them actually, a verb and an adjective. Both of them mean sound. Paul uses the word to describe uh, sound doctrine as in true doctrine rather than false doctrine, that it, is, that it is sound in its theological correctness. The other gospel authors, Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, they use the word in reference to the physical well-being of the person. You'll see there on the screen, Luke chapter 5, verse 31, that Jesus answering said to them, I believe that was the Pharisees, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. They that are whole, sound, healthy, in good physical standing don't need a physician, only those that are sick. Now, the third thing is the, the prosperity of the soul. But it's linked to the first two things by the Greek word kathos, 
which means in as much or to the same degree or extent. It's a beautiful passage as it concerns balance. You know, how many of you think that uh, spiritual well-being is the most important thing in, in life? Okay? How many people in the world think that temporal prosperity, maybe that's not you, but in society we recognize how many people in society think that financial prosperity is the goal of life? It is. Yeah, a lot of people think that. As the uh, Old Testament says, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Uh, many people trying in vain to bring happiness into their life through their finances or through the things they can acquire through their finances. Now, then there's a growing trend in society to emphasize the importance of health. And how many of you have uh, thought or heard others that think that health is the thing to be obtained in life? Longevity of life. People will do yoga and meditation and Pilates and go to the gym and lift weights and run miles and miles and miles to improve their cardiovascular uh, performance. Not drop dead of a coronary. Nobody wants to go that way. But those two things, health and prosperity, are linked to the third thing, prosperity of the soul, by that word there, which means to the same extent, to the same degree. God wants you to be financially prosperous, physically healthy, and spiritually sound. And that is a nice picture of balance. If we look at that uh, again here, our temporal success and our physical success are just as important to God as our spiritual health, as long as the first two don't cost us the third. So you see Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26, For what is a man profit of it if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? It's a question. What does a man profit if he gains the whole world but loses his eternal life? Does he? Questions are for answering. Does he gain? Does he profit? No. Is there anything that a man shall give in exchange for his soul? That's a rhetorical question. The answer in truth is... But the answer in reality is, yes, there's a lot that people exchange uh, for their soul. It's not a fair exchange. If we could look back on it when we reach eternity, there will be many people who regret the uh, exchange they made, whether that was their job or whatever it happened to be that they exchanged for their soul. But let's look at this verse again. I'm going to read it one more time. Beloved, I wished above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospered. Now, I'm going to throw a little diagram up here. And this is an uh, equal-sided triangle. And there are three components to that triangle, health, prosperity of uh, temporal affairs, and spiritual health. So you have three things there that are equally balanced, and I think they're balanced for very good reasons. Uh, can a person contribute to the world spiritually if he's not spiritually healthy? No. Does proper spiritual health provide a basis for obtaining physical health? Yes, it does. Uh, you believe that the Lord created the human body, yes? Yes. And you would believe, therefore, logically, that the creator of the human body knows what's best for the body to keep it healthy, correct? Okay? So without a proper spiritual perspective, there can't be a proper spiritual perspective on health. Uh, namely, that the God, again, knows best for the body. Now, can you contribute to your financial standing uh, without a proper spiritual perspective? Well, that's a little bit iffy, isn't it? You might benefit financially by not paying tithe. Uh, but that's not what the promise says in Isaiah, is it? If you return unto me the tithes and offerings, what does he say? I will make you to... What? He'll 
pour out the windows, uh, blessings from the windows of heaven so that you cannot receive it, okay? Can you, um, let's look at this from a different perspective. Can you contribute to the spiritual well-being of the world around you if you die when you're 50? Not to the same extent that you could if you lived till you were 80. Can you bless the world spiritually if you don't have the funds to do it? In a limited capacity, you can buy your influence. But a poverty-stricken Christian who can hardly feed his own family uh, testifies exactly what to the character of God? It's debatable, right? Does that mean you can't be a Christian and be poor? No, it doesn't. Does it mean just because you're rich that you're a Christian? No, it doesn't. My point here, and I hope you take this in stride, is that these three things are equal. Important one to another, inseparable one to another, if we want to obtain the maximum benefit from any of them. Right? Everybody with me so far? Okay. And I, I want to say one last thing on this. Uh, some of us here are imbalanced. Some of us do things, including myself, to obtain finances that rob us spiritually or rob our health. Some of us do things uh, to our health that rob us spiritually and rob us of our financial prosperity. Even if that's only, I don't go to bed and get enough sleep so my mind can't think clearly and I make stupid financial decisions because I'm groggy all day. Okay, you cannot separate any one of these from the other. And uh, I think that we need more balance in all of those areas. Certainly, financial prosperity could rob you of your spirituality or it could be a great blessing to your spirituality. But my point here is that God wants us to be prosperous in all three areas. Adventists have been fairly good about emphasizing spiritual health. We've been uh, fairly good about emphasizing uh, physical health. But we've not talked so much, and I'm not going to this morning either, talked about financial health or financial prosperity, except that God wants us to benefit in all three areas to the maximum potential. I want to go to Genesis chapter 2, and I want to focus on the uh, top leg of that that uh, pyramid there and talk this morning about physical health, the health of your body, and of course, the health of the mind, which is in your body. This won't be very thorough or exhaustive compared to perhaps other things that I've done, but it'll be a good summary, and it's intended to be a little bit more informative than challenging or anything else. Genesis chapter 2, I want to read verse 16, and then we'll go over to chapter 3 and read verse 18. Again, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, if you'll follow along, I'm not going to put it up on the screen here. So God had created man, and he's in the Garden of Eden here with the two of them. He's giving instructions to them. Verse 15 says that he had put Adam in the garden to dress it and to keep it. And then verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. The original diet, Genesis chapter 2, was to contain what items of food? The answer is fruits only. Fruits only. Okay? How many of you didn't know that? Well, nuts would be a fruit that grows on a tree. Okay. Of the fruit of the tree, that does not include vegetables which, however, are included in Genesis chapter 3, verse 18. If you would look here, this is just after the fall of Adam and Eve, tempted by the serpent. Eve gave in, and then Adam gave in to his wife Eve. And God is visiting the three of them, that is, Adam, Eve, and the serpent. And he dispensed uh, appropriate rewards to the three of them for their decisions. And uh, the woman uh, gets sorrow and labor, and unto the man, in verse 17, uh, he says, Because you listened to your wife, the end of the, the verse, Thou shalt not, uh, excuse me, uh, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and you shall eat the, what's it say? The herb of the field. What's an herb of the field? 
Okay? Grass. I see lips, but a little louder. I knew you said something. Green things, okay, and I heard it up front here. This would be vegetables, okay? Technically, a vegetable is anything that is a stem, stalk, leaf, or root of a plant. A fruit, technically, botanically, is anything that is a result of a flower and pollination and the uh, expanding of the plant's ovary into a fruit. You'll note here that uh, Genesis chapter 2 nor Genesis chapter 3 included the consumption of flesh meats. And uh, that was by design. The human body was not designed to consume flesh meat and uh, animals weren't designed to be consumed for their flesh. Uh, they'll be greatly encouraged to know that God didn't design them to be eaten. I'm going to read you a statement here from Councils on Diets and Foods. I don't want to talk long about this, but I want to mention this. She says, there is no safety in the eating of flesh, the flesh of dead animals. And in a short time, the milk of cows will also have to be excluded from the diet of God's commandment-keeping people. In a short time, it will not be safe to use anything that comes from the animal creation. Now, I'm going to read you a text of scripture. This comes from the book of Hosea. And it's chapter 4. We're going to read the first verse and the third verse. But before I, I tell you the verse here, uh, Hosea chapter 3, the very last chapter, talks about the gathering of Israel in the last days. The context here of the chapter is prophecy, uh, last day events, the end of the world, the coming of Christ, and the gathering of Christ, of, excuse me, the gathering of Christ's people. So then verse 4, verse 1 of the fourth chapter, the very next verse, says this, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. What's his controversy? Because there's no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Verse 3, Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwells therein shall languish, with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of the heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Before I comment on this verse, we need to define a word. And that word is languish. Does anybody have a different translation, different reading, or a, a synonym for the word languish? Somebody who read it in your translation have a different reading? Hosea chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 3. That was in particular verse 3. Are you out there with me? Somebody that doesn't have a King James, perhaps. Dried up, okay. Any other translations? Dried up. Um, waste away, okay. Mourn. If it says here, let's, let's play with this a little bit. Everyone that dwells therein shall languish. So everyone that dwells in the earth shall dry up. Does that make sense? Waste away. What does waste away mean? Okay. Disease in the back. And then uh, the gentleman here in the purple shirt, I didn't hear what you said. Dry up. The word means to become weak, to become feeble, to become sick. Let's back up to verse 1 and read this again. The Lord has a controversy in the last days with the people of the land because there's no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Therefore, as a result of those things, the land shall mourn, and everyone that dwells therein shall become weak, feeble, that is, sick with, or rather including, the beasts of the field, with the fowls of heaven, yes, even the fishes of the sea shall be taken away. Let me put it to you this way in an equation. As men become more and more sinful, disease becomes more and more widespread. 
the same sinfulness that leads men to break the Sabbath or to not pay tithe or whatever is the same sinfulness that leads them to disregard their own physical laws of health and the laws of health that govern the created world. Or as it says in the New, uh, New Testament, the whole creation groans and what? Travails in pain. I believe that's in the book of Romans. So here you have an Old Testament prophecy that's telling us that as sinfulness increases in men, disease will increase in the created world, whether that's human or of uh, vertebrae, uh, like beasts or the, the vertebrae, I shouldn't say vertebrae, but the fowls of heaven, the fish of the sea, regardless of the type of animal creation, disease will spread across it. In case you ever wondered if Ellen White's statements on animal consumption were, uh, that means uh, that they weren't in the scripture, I just wanted you to have Hosea 4 to stick in your brain. God told us in advance that eating animal products was going to be a risky business in the last days. I'll share a couple things with you, which I don't think that I put on the screen here. I did not. Um, 80%, 30 million pounds of antibiotics in America are exclusively sold from the pharmaceutical companies to the animal industry. Three uh, zero million pounds. Eighty percent of all antibiotics are fed to animals. And then we wonder why we have uh, certain resistant diseases in both humans and in uh, animal products. Um, how about the amount of hormones? Anybody familiar with hormones that they feed to animals? Growth hormones, typically uh, given to animals to produce their egg laying capacity, their milk yielding capacity, uh, or there are a number of different abuses. Uh, anybody know how they make veal? Veal, uh, if, you, if you are familiar, they take a male cow, a bull, and they confine it in a stall where it cannot move and where it receives no sunlight. Because vitamin D in the sunlight toughens the muscles. And movement also toughens the muscles, rendering those muscles, um, well, less palatable. So in order to provide a delicacy, we can find that animal to a very small cell. You could go on and on. There's a dairy in the valley over where we're at. Some of you have been by there. And you have seen those multiple thousands of cattle standing shoulder to shoulder, uh, six to eight inches deep in their own feces. And then you wonder why we have the spread of diseases like Salmonella and E. coli, by the way, which are entirely animal diseases. Anybody familiar with this subject? Salmonella and E. coli are intestinal bacteria. E. coli being from... Um, uh, so like cattle, I believe, if I remember this correctly, salmonella is from chickens. But they are nonetheless intestinal bacteria that do not exist, cannot live on vegetable products. The only way you can get peanut butter or spinach or some other vegetable contaminated with salmonella or E. coli is cross-contamination with a contaminated animal product like manure in the fertilizer or uh, some other type of cross-contamination like uh, using a, a similar facility to process meat and vegetables. I just want to throw this out to you. I don't want to spend any more time on this. The original diet in Eden did not include animal products. And God did not include that for the health of our physical being. And it was to become increasingly risky to eat animal products in the last days because of man's corruptness and the way that they would treat and raise animals. I know I'm largely speaking to the choir here uh, in this congregation, but it is nonetheless something that we need to think about and be encouraged that God knows the future and has written it down for us to be encouraged thereby. So I want to talk mostly about vegetables this morning. I'm just going to provide a little bit of information for you on uh, the, the state of the food industry and help you to make more intelligent decisions and to kind of push you along in a certain direction, which I'll share in just a minute. Again, I titled this morning, Quantity Versus Quality, The Case for Good Food. And I'm going to start here with some t statistics from uh, the farm industry in America. Uh, specifically here on the screen first, you'll see the number of farms in the United States by year. 
uh, the year, the total U.S. population, and then the number of farms is given from left to right. In the year 1950, the total U.S. population was about 23 million. And of those 23 million, there were 1.5 million farms in America. That works out to be about one farm for every 15 Americans. It's not a bad ratio. 60 years later in 1910, that statistic had only changed slightly, and it was actually a statistical uh, um, increase. Or how would you say this here? It was an improvement is what I'm trying to say. In 1910, there were 91 million Americans, but there were 6.3 million farms, about one farm for every 14.5 Americans. In 1935, that statistic had only changed slightly in the other direction. There were 127 million Americans and 6.8 million farms, a ratio of about one farm to every 18.6 Americans. And then right here, you'll notice the big change. Today in America, as of uh, 2007 anyway, and this is of course uh, a few years outdated, there are 13, uh, excuse me, 313 million Americans, but there are only 2.2 million farms in America. That's a ratio of one farm for every 152 Americans. Now, most farming in America is for the purpose of raising grains devoted to the feeding of cattle and hogs and chickens and other such things. It is not for the consumption of humans. Now, however, those cattle and chickens and eggs and other things are for the consumption of people. And I won't get into that, but it's a very uh, inefficient ratio when you talk about the amount of food that it takes to produce one pound of beef. It's like 100 pounds of grain, I think, for every pound of beef that you get. It's a very inefficient thing. Now, that's a ratio, again, of 152 Americans per farm with most of those farms not actually producing food for people to eat. Now, some of it goes to clothing, say cotton. Some of it goes to uh, uh, other things as well. And another interesting statistic here, this is from the USDA, by the way. This is all government statistics. I don't know if you trust the government or not, but this is a government statistic. It's not from some left-leaning environmental uh, tree hugger hippie organization that wants to promote a certain agenda. Again, this is the USDA. Their criteria for determining what a farm is was a census. So you are first and foremost dependent upon the honesty of the person answering the census. The second thing here is the criteria for determining what a farm was was an annual sales threshold of $1,000. Just want to ask you, how many of those 2.2 million farms are making less than $1,000 annually? The answer is more than half. It's a very large number of people that are making very, very little money. There are today in America more people in prison than there are farmers. There are more people in the correction system in America than there are people farming. And by the way, the USDA is the only government agency that is trying to put itself out of business. Uh, there are more farmers uh, 100, nearly 100 years ago than there are today. And uh, I don't know of any other government organization that would seek to have less of its own constituents. But that's what they're doing. There are 2.2 million farms in America, less than, uh, less than there were ever in American history, really, except for when there were 23 million people on the, on the uh, continent. And, uh, and one other interesting statistic here on this note is that most of these people consider themselves hobbyists. They're living in a rural area, and their farm happens to be their residence, not their occupation. In other words, say that differently, most people who put down that they own a farm find their primary source of income from some other occupation. So that 2.2 million is a very high number that doesn't really reflect reality. Uh, the real number is 1% of the American population that's actually farming today. Let's look at another statistic that will co coincide with the previous one here. This is the urban versus rural trend in America. In 1900, there were 39.6% of the American population living in an urban area. 40 years later, in 1940, 56.5% of the population lived in an urban area. 
But in the year 2010, the most recent statistic that I could find, 80% of the American population now lives in an urban metropolitan area. Now, I want you to notice here the correlation between those two slides. The change in farm to uh, population ratio occurred after 1935. The change of the ratio here dramatically changed from the uh, urban versus rural uh, stat here after the year 1940. And what I want to show you is what happened after the year 1940 that changed the farming demographics in America and the urban versus rural demographics in America. Um, but before I do that, I want to show you a quote here from Special Testimonies on Education. In choosing retired localities for our school, we do not for a moment suppose that we are placing the youth beyond the reach of temptation. So you're going to hear me say this again. Because you live in the country doesn't mean you're a saint. Because you live in the city doesn't mean you're a sinner. It's not salvation by rurality. But Satan is a very diligent worker, and he's untiring in devising ways to corrupt every mind that is open to his suggestions. He meets families and individuals on their own ground, adapting his temptations to their inclinations and weaknesses. But in the large cities, his power over minds is greater, and his nets for the entanglement of unwary feet are more numerous. The shift in agriculture has led to a shift in American demographics from the rural areas to the urban areas where temptations are stronger and more prevalent. Well, there was a thing in the 1940s that started and culminated in the 60s called the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution was a, uh, a transition period in American agriculture. There was four basic transitions in that time period. Number one was mechanized farming. Number two was improved, supposedly, crop varieties. And number three and four were chemical fertilizers and pesticides, respectively. And I say all classes of pesticide because a pesticide is considered anything that would include insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, uh, et cetera, et cetera. A, a chemical pesticide includes a whole category of those chemicals. And I want to look at these more or less one at a time, except for the first one. And I want to start with crop yield and nutrition. And uh, there are three basic criteria for selecting a new crop variety. And I want you to notice very carefully what they are, because this is the most important thing that I'm about to tell you as it relates to food today. There are three basic criteria, the first one being yield. Will this new variety be a top performer? Will it be, in other words, efficient? If the, if the farmer drives his tractor across the field, is it going to give him the, the fastest fill on his combine per foot travel. The most bushels per acre or pounds per acre. The second thing is appearance because customers like you, like me, always go to the store and buy the dinged up, banged up, dented can box, right? No. Nobody in here walks into the grocery store thinking, I want to buy the ugliest tomato I can find. We like things round. We like them uniform. We like the color right. You know, if it's got a pimple on the potato, we don't want to eat it. If it's got this warty looking thing on the apple or a dimple where the worm went in, we don't want to eat it. So we buy the things that are cosmetically perfect. And the third thing, of course, is pest resistance. They breed crops that are genetically or physically um, resistant to pests, corn earworm or potato beetle or whatever. So let me give you some statistics here on how successful we've been at this. In the year 1950, which by the way, I say at the bottom of the screen, for years and years and years, the USDA has compiled the nutritional data on every crop harvested in America. Uh, it's a massive uh, project by itself. And again, this is a government statistic. They've compiled the data on all these crops. Their, their nutritional data, their yield data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this one here first is their yield data from 1950. I want to read through these here. 
1950, if you were a farmer, you could expect to harvest 1,500 to 2,200 pounds per acre of rice. Add 50 years to that in the year 2000, and look at that 195% increase in yield, going to 6,500 or 7,000 pounds of rice per acre. If you could improve something in your life by 195%, would you do it? Depends. How about beans? 600 pounds of the acre, 50 years later, 16 to 1,700 pounds of the acre. Wheat, the same thing. 12 to 15 bushels in 1950, in the year 2000, 40 to 45 bushels per acre. Uh, corn, 20 to 40. You're going to see a big jump right here. 20 to 40 bushels per acre on corn in 1950. In the year 2000, 150 bushels per acre. That's a 275% increase in yield over a 50-year period. And the potatoes is the big one here. If you were a farmer in the year 1950, you'd get 7,000 pounds of potatoes per acre. 50 years later, read that number, 39,000 pounds of potatoes per acre. That's almost a 500% increase in yield. If I could promise you a 500% increase in your prosperity in life, would you go for it? Ah, good question. I like red back there. He's thinking here. And the question is, well, what did they sacrifice? So the same government compiling is, again, I said, the nutritional data of those very crops. Uh, that data was taken by some researchers at the University of Texas, and they compared 43 vegetables that were grown in the year 1950 that were still being grown in the year 1999. As a group, they found that the nutritional value of those crops had dr dramatically Decreased. I'll give you some specifics there. Calcium had decreased by 16%, 15% decrease in iron, 15% decrease in ascorbic acid. What's that, by the way? Vitamin C. Phosphorus decreased by 9%. Riboflavin, 38% decrease. What's riboflavin? Vitamin B2, actually, I think. It's up for debate there. And a 6% decrease in protein. That's on the general, that's on the whole. That's an average. If you look at some specific crops, it was much less encouraging. Corn, 50 years later, had 78% less calcium, 26% less phosphorus, 50% less riboflavin, 43% less ascorbic acid, but he did see a modest increase in iron by 4%. Tomatoes, I picked this one here because everybody knows in the last 50 years, the flavor of tomatoes has hit the tank and drowned at the bottom of it. 55% less calcium, 25% less iron, 11% less phosphorus, 17% less ascorbic acid. However, they did see a 20% increase in riboflavin. How many of you have ever had sea salt? Does it taste the same or different than regular table salt. Taste the same? It does taste just a little bit different. No sugar. I don't add sugar to my salt. That's pretty impressive when a society is so fixed on sugar that they're adding sugar to their salt. But Strictly speaking of table salt, sodium chloride only, what's the difference between uh, table salt and sea salt? Where it's from, yes. Processing. You know the real difference? 2%. 2% extra minerals in sea salt or rock salt that's not in processed table salt. If you want to know why sea salt tastes just a little bit different than regular table salt, it's that 2%. And that's why your tomatoes don't taste like they used to when you grew up as a kid, eating your grandmother's tomatoes off her garden. You know, the produce that you're buying in the store today might be cheap because we've industrialized agriculture. But the cheapness comes at a cost, and the cost in America has been nutrition. 
where the foods you eat today have less quality, have less flavor, and have less benefit to you nutritionally because of the very practices that increased their yield or increased their resistance to disease or in increased their cosmetic appearance. Those crops, in other words, were selected for those traits, but nobody was really concerned about growing the crops that also were good for you. I titled the next slide, Bombs Away. A little bit of history here. Nitrogen was originally used to make uh, ammonia, which was then used to make ammunition during World War II. Some uh, creative scientists figured out that nitrogen was also a really good plant fertilizer. And when World War II ended, guess what? They had lots and lots and lots of extra nitrogen kicking around the country because of those 12 nitrogen processing plants that they built in America to build bombs and other things. And so somebody's got a big stockpile on their hands. And what do you do with excess nitrogen? Well, by the way, before I get to that, this is a picture of the city of West in Texas. You've seen the news recently. Let me come down here for just a second. No, it's not Wilcox. This right here is the West Fertilizer Plant. This over here is the middle school. Just below it, which you can't see would be down there, would be the high school. This right here is a uh, nursing home for seniors. That is a, it wasn't a joke, that's really what it was. That's a tennis court, that's a playground for kids. There are other housing developments and complexes behind that. Would you like to know what a couple tons of ammonia fertilizer sitting around a fire-laden fertilizer plant will do? Well, that's what it does. Okay? This is why they used ammonia and the munitions during World War II, because those fertilizers go boom. If you've seen a video of that, by the way, there are videos on the internet. You ought to check out how powerful a couple tons of ammonia sitting around is. It literally sent a shockwave through the town for several miles. A huge explosion. Just a couple tons of it. So, of course, what do we do? Let's put it on the ground. So, most fertilizers today are designed to force a plant to grow and fruit in a cheap manner because processing ammonia is a relatively inexpensive process uh, compared to other things. Uh, and nitrogen will literally, boom, kick a plant and force it to grow. There are three of those, actually. Um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. You see at the bottom there the NPK. In case you've ever wondered why K stands for potassium, that's because the Germans call it kalium. And uh, I don't know why it's in German and English, but it is. But there are uh, a problem here. There is a problem here. There are 13, at a minimum, essential plant nutrients today for plants. That's what science tells us. A minimum 13. But when you go to the store and you buy a bag of fertilizer, it'll have three numbers on it. And those three numbers, most of you know, are your nitrogen percentage, your potassium percentage, and your phosphorus percentage. I said the last two in reverse order. Well, what about the other 10 plus? <clears throat> you don't need those to force a plant to grow. See, to farm profitably today, you use a minimum. This is just standard business practice, by the way. You cut down on your inputs, your expenses, and you jump up your revenue, right? So the less things you have to buy to put on your farm's fields, the more profit you have at the end of the day. But what you wind up with is an essentially hollow crop because you're forcing the plant to grow with certain plant chemicals, synthetic ones in particular, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but neglect the other is nutritious for you. One of those being calcium, which you saw dramatically decreased on the previous two slides. Another really interesting thing about uh, chemical fertilizers today when a bomb hits the ground, it makes a mess. And you take those same chemical fertilizers and you put them on the ground. And, uh, oh, I almost skipped a statement here. This is from the University of Florida. This is from a uh, document they released a couple of years ago, and I'll read it to you. It's relevant. In general, nutrient pathogen interactions are not well understood. However, you might say, 
Plant nutrients may affect disease susceptibility through plant metabolic changes, thereby creating a more favorable environment for disease development. I wanted to show you that now because it's going to come back up later. When you talk about the health of you, the health of me, or the health of a crop, that is somewhat determined by your nutritional uh, quality of life. If you are nutritionally deficient in some way, shape, or form, it makes you more susceptible to disease of some shape or form. So you guys know that. That's not uh, rocket science right there. But anyway, it's from the University of Florida pointing out the same thing is true with plants. If there's a problem with the plant's nutrient availability, it affects its metabolism and makes it more susceptible to disease of some kind or some form. So let's move on here. The third thing here is, uh, I was going to say, when a bomb hits the ground, it makes a big mess. And when you take the same chemical fertilizer and you drop it on the field of a farm, you know what it does? It makes a big mess. Because inside of the soil, uh, there are millions of bacteria, beneficial. And when those chemicals hit the ground, even if it's a fertilizer, many of them are salt-based or they have really extreme pHs and they destroy all the microbial life in the soil. And uh, if you've, if you've uh, any fascination with plants, I know Keith does, you'll know that the plants in the ground, particularly their roots, form symbiotic relationships with uh, uh, the bacteria and the fungus in the ground. Well, here's another interesting st statistic. There are, don't gasp, one trillion, that is with a T, beneficial bacteria living in and on your body. Did you know that? When you grew up, did you ever watch, uh, did you ever watch Charlie Brown? Come on, nobody here watched Charlie Brown? Okay. All right. My favorite character in Charlie Brown, just kidding, was our favorite character. That was Pigpen. How many of you remember Pigpen? Pigpen was the little kid that always ran around, and he had the dust cloud that followed him everywhere. I just want you to realize right now you have a bacteria cloud. And the person that you're snuggling with in the pews if you're married, and the person that you're sitting next to has a bacteria cloud, and you're exchanging bacteria, and you thought it was just your influence that you were giving each other this morning. <laughs> this is how people get sick. You don't think about it. But there are one trillion bacteria in and on the human body. It's an amazing thought. Oh, I've been saying one. It is 100 trillion. I'm sorry. Double check me on that. Make sure I'm not crazy. Here's another one. This is very similar. In one teaspoon, not a tablespoon, in one teaspoon of healthy soil, there are 100 million to 1 billion bacteria. That's an amazing number. In a spoonful of dirt. Amazing thought. So when you take a synthetic chemical and you drop it on the ground, it literally obliterates that little village of bacteria in the ground. And uh, on a different note here, we are a germophobic, hypersanitary society. Don't shake my hand when we're done with church. And we wash all the bacteria off religiously. Get it off. Get it off. Wash it all off. Scrub it off. You know, I wonder what it would be like if you opened your hatch and poured down some bleach and just cleaned out all the bacteria that were in your system down here. Now, the bleach would kill you by itself, but do you know what would happen if you eliminated all the bacteria in your intestinal tract? You would die. Okay. But we do that to our food system. It's an interesting little thought for you to consider. There are, uh, continuing here, this is now about... Uh, pesticides and fungicides as well. About 5.2 billion pounds of pesticides used annually in the world. And ironically, despite improvements in technology, pesticide use is going up and not down. And there is uh, anywhere from 40-something to 50-something, can't remember the exact statistic, traceable pesticides on the certain produce that you eat today. Um, some are worse than others, and I put the worst ones up on the screen. This is what they call the dirty dozen. 
If you're not going to eat something because it's um, likely to be laden with pesticides with other chemicals, these are the ones you really want to avoid in the store. Those include apples, celery, cherry tomatoes, grapes, cucumbers, hot peppers, nectarines that are imported. I don't know what the difference is between domestic ones. Uh, spinach, kale, and other greens like collards, strawberries, sweet peppers, bell peppers that is, and potatoes. One of the worst ones I know you can eat is potatoes uh, because they use them specifically after other crops to pull things out of the ground. Kind of an interesting thought right there. Um, what am I getting at with all of this? Let's go back to 3 John verse 2. Did I put it up here? I did not. 3 John verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your souls prosper. God desires for us to be financially prosperous. That is true. God desires for us to be uh, spiritually prosperous, and that is equally as true, certainly. But God also wants us to be physically prosperous as well. And I want to throw this out to you. I don't want to be extreme and fanatical on one side or the other, but I want to throw it out for your discussion. Are you interested in the food you eat? And how interested are you in the food you eat? We're all interested because of one thing at a minimum, and that's your palate. We often select food based on its taste. We salt it to taste. We flavor it to taste. We buy it because we like the flavor of it and because we, rightfully so, enjoy eating it. But the flavor of something is not the only reason to consider uh, your dietary selection process. The value of the thing you're eating for your health is equally, perhaps even more so, important. Now, if you've ever eaten in my house or eaten any of my wife's dishes here, um, we generally strive towards not making healthy food taste like garbage. And I would encourage you to do the same thing. I'm not saying that it does. But we select food based on more than just its flavor. We often forget, though, that nutrition and value is perhaps the most important reason to select the food that we eat. Now, some of you haven't been here when you've heard me speak in the past, and uh, I have been speaking the last couple times on the value of agriculture in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and in society in general. And I want to close with uh, two statements here. Sixth volume of the Testimonies, Ellen White writes, the study of an agricultural line should be the ABC of the education given in our schools. This is the very first work that should be entered upon, for our schools should not be dependent upon imported produce for grain and vegetables and the fruits so essential to health. You eat produce, you eat food, because it's vital to your health. And I want to, with these few little statistics I've shared, I want to encourage you to think about the value of produce in your life and ask you, uh, to be a little bit more contemplative towards gardening. You have a good reason for wanting to have a garden yourself because the quality of produce that you can grow at home is higher than the quality of the produce that you can typically buy in a store. And by the way, just because something is organic doesn't mean that it's better. It may have less pesticides on it, but it doesn't mean that the nutritional value of organic produce is necessarily better than that of conventional produce. One other statement here. This comes from uh, councils and diets and foods. Families and institutions should learn to do more in the cultivation and improvement of the land. If people only knew the value of the products of the ground, which the earth brings forth in their season, more diligent efforts would be made to cultivate the soil. All should be acquainted with the special value of fruits and vegetables fresh from the orchard and garden. And when she uses the word fresh, the average plate of American food traveled 1,500 miles before you got to eat it. Anybody know how far 1,500 miles is? Say from here to where? South Dakota? It's a long ways. How far is it to El Paso? Just shy of 400 miles, I think, right? So now you can almost 
quadruple that. I think you're where 1,500 miles takes you. It'd be a long ways past El Paso. To get a banana from 1,500 miles away to Benson, Arizona, requires what? That you pick it green. If you pick a fruit when it's biologically immature, it has also not obtained its nutritional maturity. And you are eating, by default, nutritionally inferior produce. All should be acquainted with the special value of fruits and vegetables fresh from the orchard and garden. And if we understood the value of the products of the ground which the earth brings forth in their season, more diligent efforts would be made to cultivate the soil. I want to encourage you again just to think, just really to contemplate on the value of having a garden at home for yourself. I'm going to summarize with a couple of, uh, of uh, things that won't be on the slides here. Number one, we talked previously about the spiritual benefit of agriculture, of farming, of gardening. That every time you're out in your garden staring at a tomato, staring at a potato or raspberries or digging in the dirt, there is a lesson there for you. And I think between your physical health and your spiritual health, the offer of agriculture to you is worth your investment in it. Let me give you some examples. If you take a synthetic chemical and you pour it on the ground, it has an effect, a negative one, on the microbiology of the soil. What influences do synthetic uh, stimuli have on the soil of your heart? Have you thought recently about the quality of the uh, fertilizers that you're pouring onto your life? Whether that's television or music or friends or your job or whatever it happens to be. Is the thing that you're pouring onto the soil of your heart going to destroy or build up the fertility of your spiritual life? Have you thought about it recently? What are you putting into your life? Synthetics? Naturals? Have you thought about the fact that temptations are greater in the city and that to farm means you have to have something? Land. And the bigger your farm, the further away you have to be from your neighbor. Have you thought about that? We live in the little cookie cutter plots in the city where our neighbors are able to stick out their hands and shake ours through their window. Are your neighbors a good influence on the soil of your heart? Are you selecting the, the things that you put into your life based on the entertainment and the flavor value they give to you? Or are you selecting the things you put into your life because of the quality that they will bring to your spiritual life? just one object lesson. As you think through these slides, I think there are others. Uh, for example, another one is, should a Christian really treat an animal in such a way as modern agriculture treats it? Is that a lesson for us in the viability of life? Would you treat your neighbor like people treat their cow? Some do. Would your neighbor be happy? Could you confine your neighbor to a cell and love your neighbor as yourself? You know, when you really start to think about it, there are a lot of things that, that would teach us about the spiritual life that would make us better Christians. And certainly those are, are a couple of them, and there are many, many, many others that we should think about. There is a value for us in thinking about farming, gardening, agriculture, it's all the same thing, different size and different scale. But the value that it brings to us spiritually and the value that it brings to us physically in regard to our health. Do you really want to put your spiritual or your physical health into the hands of some corporate or bureaucratic or political institution? When the most important things you have are the things you put into your mouth, 
and the things you put in your brain, it would be well for us to put it in our own hands and to make sure that we're feeding ourselves the best that we can possibly be. Will it mean there won't be temptations? Nah. Because temptations come from right here. Not from out there. I hope this stimulates your thought. It's a little bit different than anything I've done here in the past. I do hope, again, though, that you'll think about it, to contemplate it. There's a benefit here that we need to experience, and I ask you to think about this morning. Let's pray.